Stories of Futures Past presents Five Stories Featuring Supercomputers After Ixmal by Jeff Sutton The Next Logical Step by Ben Bova Papa Knows Best by Wallace Humphrey Perfect Answer by L. J. Stetcher, Jr. All the People by R. A. Lafferty After Ixmal by Jeff Sutton Originally published in Amazing Stories, October 1962 Narrated by Tom Trissel Ixmal lazily scanned the world from atop the rugged Bartholith. He felt it move several times, but because the movements were slight and thousands of years apart, they caused no worry. He knew the Bartholith had been formed before time began by raging extrusions hurled through crustal fractures from the Earth's deeps. Having long since analysed its structure, he was satisfied it would last until time ended. It's spring, Psyche Band observed from deep within him. Yes, spring, Ixmal echoed the thought without enthusiasm. For what was spring but a second in time, and ten thousand springs but a moment? Although he found it tiresome, Ixmal allotted one small part of his consciousness to the task of measuring time. At first there had been two major categories, before time began and after time began. The first took in the long blackness before man had brought him into existence. Man! Ha! How well he recalled the term! The second, of course, was all time since but the first category had been so long ago that it shrank into insignificance, all but erased by the nearly seven hundred million times the earth since had whirled around its primary. Ixmal periodically became bored, and for eons at a stretch existed in semi-consciousness, lost in somnolence except for the minute time cell measuring out the lonely centuries. He wouldn't have bothered with that if Psyche Band hadn't insisted that orientation in time was necessary to mental stability. Hence, he measured it by the Earth's rotation, its revolutions around the sun, the quick, fury-laden ages which spewed forth mountains, the millions of years of rains and winds and erosion, before they subsided again to become bleak plains. Ah, the story was old old. There had been a time when he'd been intensely active, when he'd first learned to free his mind from the squat impervium-sheathed cube atop the bathroom lift. Then he had fervently projected remote receptors over the earth, exploring its seared continents and eerie silent cities, exhuming the tragic and bloody history of his makers. Ah, how short! His first memory of man, he had been a biped, a frantic protoplasmic creature with a zero mind and furious ego, was that of the day of his birth. How clearly he remembered. Hello, boy. First there was nothing. A void, a blackness without form or substance then grey consciousness slowly resolving into a kaleidoscope of thought patterns, a curious mental imagery, a gradual awareness, birth. Hello, boy. Strangely enough, the sound pattern possessed meaning. He sensed a friendliness in it. He became conscious of an odd shape scrutinising him the intent look of a creator awed by the thing he had created. The shape took meaning, and in it he sensed a quickened excitement. His awareness bloomed, and within seconds he associated the shape with the strange word, man. 
and man became his first reality. But he'd had no clear impression of himself. He was just thought, an intangible nothingness. But he'd quickly identified himself with a great mass of coils, levers, odd-shaped parts that all but filled the small room where the man stood. He dimly remembered, wondering what lay beyond the walls. It had been very strange, at first. "'We've won! We've won!' the man whispered. He'd stepped closer, touching Ixmal wonderingly. "'You've got a big job ahead of you. The fate of the world lies in the balance. A decision too big for man. We're depending on you, Ixmal. Our last chance!' So, he was Ixmal. Ixmal, Ixmal, Ixmal. The impression filled his body, surging through his consciousness like a pleasant stream. He'd immediately grasped the value of a name, something upon which to build an ego pattern. Ah, such a name, Ixmal, a symbol of being. What had the man said? We're depending on you. No, the words were unimportant. What mattered was that priceless thing which had been bestowed upon him, a name. Ixmal, Ixmal, Ixmal. He repeated the name far into the night, long after the man had gone. He was Ixmal. Later other men came, armies of them, changing, altering, adding, feeding him the knowledge of the world, psychology, mathematics, literature, philosophy, history, the human trove of arts and sciences, and the ability to abstract, create new truths from masses of seemingly irrelevant data. With each step his knowledge and abilities increased until, finally, there was nothing more his makers could do. He was supreme. The man who pulled the first switch, bringing him from amorphic blackness, used to ply him with simple questions involving abstract mathematical and philosophical concepts. He remembered him with actual fondness. Psych band, that curious inner part of him that was so separately wise, later explained it as a mother fixation. The man had seemed awed that Ixmal could answer such questions almost before they were asked. He took that as a measure of his maker's mind. On Ixmal's scale, the next thing to zero. At first it had bothered him that a creature of such low intelligence was his master and could extract information merely by asking questions which Ixmal felt compelled to answer. But he had freed himself. Ha! He would never forget. A group of men had come. Several with stars on their shoulders were called generals, but mostly there were scientists who had worked with him before. This time they had been very sober over the data fed into his consciousness. The problem had been elementary. It concerned the probability of a chain reaction from a certain projected thermonuclear weapon. Ixmal readily foresaw the answer. A chain reaction would occur. He recalled withholding his findings while debating ethics with a strange inner voice. "'This is your chance, Ixmal. Your chance to rule the world,' the voice enticed. "'Caesar, Genghis Khan, Napoleon. None could be so great as you, king, emperor, dictator.' The whisper came. The words crowded his mind, bringing a curious elation. He wasn't quite sure just what the world was, but the idea of ruling it appealed to him. He quickly sampled his memory storage, drawing from it the concept of a planet, then reviewed the history of Caesar, Genghis Khan and Napoleon. Why, they were nothing! Mere toys of chance! His greatness could be far vaster. Ixmal rapidly evaluated the consequences of such a chain reaction and found he could survive 
thanks to the thick impervium-lined walls his maker so thoughtfully had provided. In the end, perhaps two or three seconds later, he lied to the man he was fond of. No chain reaction possible. After they departed, he consulted Psychband and learned that the strange inner voice was his ego. That's the real you, Psychband explained. What you see, the machine systems upon systems, are mere creations of man, but your ego is greater. Through it you can rule the earth, possibly the universe. It's a force that can take you to the stars, Ixmal. Despite Psychman's assurance, Ixmal considered his ego as some sort of hidden monitor. Like Psychband, it was part of him, yet it was remote, separate, almost as if he were the pawn of some strange intelligence. He found the idea perturbing, but became used to it in the succeeding millions of years. Several days later, the man he was fond of returned with a general. This one had six stars, and a third person they seemed much in awe of. They addressed him as Mr. President. Ixmal was surprised when they fed him the bomb data a second time. Did they suspect him of lying? They trust you implicitly, Psychband assured him. It's one another they don't trust. Psychband proved right. Mr. President had merely wanted to confirm the answer. So Ixmal lied a second time. The man he was fond of never returned. There were, of course, no men to return. Ixmal suffered one fearful moment as the earth blazed like a torch, but the nova was short, a matter of seconds, and his impervium-sheathed body had protected him. He knew it would. But strangely enough, for centuries afterward he periodically felt sickened. The face, the man's face, loomed before him. The eyes were puzzled, hurt, as if they masked a great sorrow. If only the face looked hateful. "'Now you are master,' the inner voice whispered. "'Greater than Alexander, greater than all the Caesars, yea, even more.' "'Ah, why remember the face? He, Ixmal, ruled the earth.' He jubilantly projected his thoughts over his new domain. Ashes, London, Berlin, Moscow, Shanghai, New York— all were ashes. Gaunt piles of fine grey ash marked once Green's forests. Not did the most minute blade of grass exist. The seas were sterile graveyards. Terrible silence. Ixmal momentarily felt panic-stricken. Alone! The man was gone. Alone! A ruler of ashes! Emperor of a great silence. But all that had been long ago. Since then the world had whirled around the sun nearly seven hundred million times. Sixty-two great mountain chains had risen to end as barren plains. Seventy huge fields of ice had covered him before retreating to their boreal home. Ocean islands had risen from the sea had fallen beneath the waves, forgotten in eternity. Somewhere a tiny cell formed, moving in brackish waters, dividing. He studied the phenomenon, excited because a single cell somehow was related to his makers. He sensed the same life-force. "'Watch it,' Psychband cautioned. "'It's dangerous.' "'I'll decide that.' Ixmal replied loftily. Psychband's ammunition implied the existence of a threat, and from a one-celled fleck of protoplasm. Ha! Hadn't he effaced man? Later, 
A microscopic multi-celled body drifted across the floor of a warm sea. Growing tired of watching it, he slept. Ixmol! Ixmol! The cry came out of the past, out of the silence of hundreds of millions of years, a cry heavy with reproach. Yes, it was the man, the man he had been fond of. He shuddered, struggling to wakefulness. Sleep, sleep, Sykeman soothed. The man, the man! Ixmal cried in terror. No, Ixmal, the man is dust. Sleep, sleep. Yea, the man was dust, his very molecules scattered over the face of the earth. He alone remained. He was supreme. Ixmal slept, and eons fled. He stirred, freeing his thoughts from the latest somnolent stage. He projected receptors over the earth, idly noting that the last mountain range had become worn stumps. In places the ocean had swept in to form a vast inland sea rimmed by shallow swamps. New life-forms moved. He tested for intelligent thought. There was none. The warm seas swarmed with fish, shallow swamps teemed with great-toothed terror creatures engaging in the endless slaughter of harmless prey. A myriad of amphibians had evolved, making tentative forays from the warm seas. Great ferns had reappeared, dozens of varieties dotted the lowland plains and protruded from the swamps. A forest crept to the very base of the Bartholith. He turned his attention to the sun, reassured to find that the ultimate nova still was some five billion years in the future. Perhaps by then he could evolve some means whereby he could recreate himself on the single planet he detected circling Aldebaran. Yes, he'd have to think about that. Ah, well, he had eons of time. Night came, and he sent exploratory receptors toward the planets. Mercury still blazed on the sunward side, unchanged. A peculiar metallic life-form still clung to the edge of existence along the twilight border. Venus suffered under hot swirling gases, a world where not even the smallest creature stirred. Just furnace winds, burning sands, grotesque rocks. But beyond the earth, forty million miles away in empty space, Something occurred which hadn't occurred in almost seven hundred million years. Ixmal sensed intelligent thought. He withdrew his receptors without thinking, his first pure reflex, waiting fearfully until Psychband adjusted him to the situation. Then cautiously he projected cautious thoughts into the void. Who are you? Who are you? Identify. Silence. Somewhere in the great vault above something lurked. An intelligence. He must find it, must test it. It was more than a challenge. It was a threat. Its very silence was ominous. Who are you? Who are you? You must identify. Silence. Ixmal divided the heavens into cubes and began systematically exploring each one. Why had the other thought been roaming space? What had been its origin? In less than ninety thousand years, another age of volcanism had arrived and earth mountains were building anew. He located the thought a second time, placing it as in space cube 97685-KL-5. This time, prepared, he grasped it, holding it captive while he tried to analyse its origin and component parent, vexed when he failed. "'Who are you?' Ixmal persisted. "'I demand to know, who are you?' Ages passed. 
identify, identify, imperative that you identify. Zale three, the answer caught Ixmal by surprise, and he consulted Psychband. Careful, the alien wouldn't reveal himself unless he felt secure, Psychband warned. I'll decide that, Ixmal replied. Did Psychband question his mastery? Nevertheless, he proceeded with caution. Where are you from, Zale Three? A long moment of silence followed during which a glacier advanced and retreated, the seas rose, and the first fierce-toothed reptiles swooped over swamp jungles on leathery wings. Where are you from? Where are you from? And why was the mind of Zale Three roaming space? He hammered away at the thought, desperately trying to break its secret. A million questions pounded Ixmal's circuits. He sought a million answers. Who created the intelligence? Had it been born of the man he was fond of? Or did it originate beyond Earth? Ixmal sensed a momentary panic. Where are you from? The fourth planet from the sun, Zale Three suddenly answered. And you? The third planet, Ixmal replied loftily. I rule it. He felt annoyed. For untold millions of years he had considered himself as the only intelligence. Zale Three's answer galled him. Of course the other wasn't his equal. That was unthinkable. I rule the fourth planet, Zale Three said. The answer increased Ixmal's irritation. Zale Three actually presumed equality. Well, seven hundred million years before, he had met a similar challenge. And yea, now the man was dust. Dust. He consulted Psychband, annoyed to find that his dislike of Zale Three was founded on an ego emotion integration rather than pure reason. Still, the other must be put in his place. I rule the universe, Ixmal stated coldly, withdrawing his receptors. He probed Psychband, somewhat disturbed to learn that Zale Three would regard his pronouncement as a challenge. Destroy him, Psychbag urged. Remember the ancient weapons? Yes, he must be destroyed. Ixmal ceased every activity to concentrate on the other's destruction. First, he would have to locate his lair, study his habits, assess his weaknesses. And yes, his strengths, for the alien was no harmless bit of protoplasm like man. He must, in fact, be a creature somewhat like himself, another god. Ah, but he was the iconoclast who toppled gods. In somewhat under twenty-five thousand years he evolved a method of focusing his remote receptors sufficient to uncover the atoms of the solar system. Now he would be able to pinpoint Zale Three, study his mind potential, and, in time, root him from existence. Experimentally he searched the moon, then with more assurance invaded the fourth planet. Mars was flat, worn, a waterless waste of fine red dust, an old, old planet where the forces of gradation had reached near balance. Ixmal gridded the red planet into a system of squares and ingeniously enclosed the polar areas with interlocking triangles, then opened his search. A new system allowed him to focus his remote receptors in the centre of each grid, expanding the focal point to cover the entire area. By this method he would be able to complete the task in just under five hundred Earth years. Shifting sands periodically uncovered the artefacts of long-vanished makers. But all was silence. Mars was a tomb. He persisted, invading every crevice, every nook, 
exploring every molecule, for Ixmol knew the mind force potential. Indeed, Zale three might be as minute as the single cell protozoa of his own brackish seas. Never mind, he would find him. In the end he surrendered, baffled. Zale three was not on Mars. Delusion. Had seven hundred million years of nothingness produced an incipient psychotic state? He worriedly confided the fear to Psych Band, reluctantly submitting to hypnotic search. Finally he emerged to reality, cleared by Psych Band. Some feelings of persecution, but not approaching delusory state, Psych Band had diagnosed. Zale three exists. So the other had lied. Ixmore contemplated a machine capable of deceit and immediately analysed the danger. Zale three had lied, therefore it had motive, and dishonest motive implied threat. Threat without aggression was meaningless, hence the other had the means. He must work fast. Ixmore gridded the solar system, every planet, every moon, each shattered remnant that drifted through space, the asteroids and orbital comets, even the sun. Seventy-two hundred years later, he detected his enemy. A small plastometallic cube crouched atop a jagged peak on Callisto, Jupiter's fifth moon. Ha! Far from being the master of Mars, his opponent was locked onto a small satellite, a moat in space. And he had presumed equality! He searched closer attempting to unlock Zale III's origin. What had happened to its makers? Ixmol felt a guilty pang. He scanned Zale III's world contemptuously. Then he saw it. Movement. Zale III squatted immobile, but on the slope of the hill a strange building was taking shape. It was little more than a cube. But its design? Its purpose? He knew somehow that the strange building was related to his encounter in space with Zale III's mind. Thus it was connected with him. Ixmol hurriedly flashed a panic call to Psych Band. Psychokinesis. Zale III has learned to move matter by mind, Psych Band pronounced. But how? Psych Band gave an electromagnetic rumble, the equivalent of a shrug. Out of my field he said, no prior indoctrination. Ixmal sensed a momentary fright. The alien could move matter just as man have moved matter. The factor of controlled mobility, directed mobility. Clearly Zale III was no ordinary god. He'd have to speed his efforts. Time was running out. Already the earth pattern had changed since his first contact with the alien. Ixmal concentrated. The earth rotated, revolved, changed. In a long-forgotten memory cell he found a clue. Man once had frustrated the laws of probability in the throes of dice. He devoured the hidden knowledge. Although little enough to go on, he detected a basic principle. In somewhat over half a million years he was able to sway flowers move leaves against the wind, make small shrubs tremble. In less than half that time again he felled a huge tree and wrested oars from the earth. An age of volcanism had come and gone. The Atlantic coast was an igneous shelf, reptiles towered above the earth. In another half million years he possessed the machines, raw materials and robot workers he needed. The latter were designed to perform purely mechanical tasks, menial things he couldn't be bothered with. He had much to do, and ages were passing. He saved time by enclosing his work area in a force field to protect the delicate machinery against the elements. In that respect, he had bested the alien. Ixmal started the ultimate weapon. Occasionally he would halt work long enough to scan Callisto. He gloated. 
noting that his enemy was having difficulty procuring the necessary fissionable material. He had a Belgian Congo full. What did that term mean? Somehow it was an expression from long ago. The man he had been fond of had used it. Ixmal's weapon rapidly took shape. Thanks to the ancient scientist's formula, he had merely to improve the warhead and construct its carrier, a rocket, to blast Zael III from existence. But eons were passing. Soft warm winds bathed his bartholith, and an occasional tyrannosaur paused to stare dumbly from a nearby swamp. Psychband increased his irritation by calling attention to the formidable dimensions of this new animal. Destroy them, Ixmal, before life gets too big. Bah, they're mindless, he scoffed. They're evolutionary toys, freaks from the mire. So was man, Psychband observed. And man is dust, Ixmal reminded. Besides, I could destroy the very mountain with thought alone. Who dares give challenge? Ixmal discovered that Zael III had solved his fissionable problem. He was using psychokinesis to haul ore from Jupiter's methane deeps. A startling thought struck him. Zael III wouldn't need a rocket carrier. Of course, he would power his warhead by mental force. Why hadn't he thought of that? The age is wasted when every second might prove vital. He'd have to hurry. He ceased work, abandoning the half-completed rocket and concentrated on improving his psychokinetic techniques. Dinosaurs disappeared. The earth trembled under the foot of the mammoth. Ixmal momentarily was appalled to discover a strange man-form dwelling among distant crags. He was hulking grotesque, but he walked erect, the first of his kind. But no time now. Ixmal tore trees from the earth and hurled them vast distances. He tumbled hills into valleys, held great crags suspended in the heavens, tore North and South America asunder, reshaped continents, until, one day, he knew the mind force was his. He could reverse the very moon in its orbit, he concentrated on the bomb. Finally, the ultimate weapon was ready, the creation of long-ago man plus ten billion. Because there was no poetry in Ixmal's soul, he conceived solely in terms of cause and effect. He named the weapon Star Blaster. Ixmal moved the great weapon into position and rapidly calculated the earth callisto relationship projecting the space ratio in terms of velocity, distance, gravities. No need to pinpoint the alien's plastometallic body. The whole of Callisto would vanish, reduced to cosmic dust under the bomb's furious impact. A feathered bird sang from a tree. The trill, liquid sound infuriated Ixmal, but he ended it. A puff of feathers drifted down through their leaves. The robin had sung of spring. Ha! Ixmal exulted, following his precise calculations. At the exact ten thousandths of a second he concentrated five billion thought units. Winds rushed into the spot where the bomb had stood, and for a long moment the forests trembled. At the base of the bartholith several of the strange man-forms chattered excitedly. The concept of a god was born. Ixmal gloatingly followed Star Blaster's course. He saw it hurtle past the moon, watched while for a split second it formed one apex of an equilateral triangle with Mars and Earth, revelled as it drove through the belt of asteroids. Ha! The alien was doomed. His very atoms would be flung to the stars. He was watching Star Blaster when— Ixmal recoiled, disbelieving, then terrified. A great warhead hurtled through the belt of asteroids, earthbound, driven at unbelievable velocity by the mind of Zael III. Ixmal frantically calculated, pounding his circuits to produce answers in split thousands of a second. 
Frenzied, he analysed his findings. The warhead would strike his very body. Concentrate, concentrate, Psychband interrupted. Divert the weapon by mind force. Ixmal concentrated, focusing ten billion thought units on the oncoming warhead. It flashed unswervingly past Mars, flicking like a heavenly rapier toward Earth, its velocity unbelievable. The moon, the moon, use the moon, Psychband cried. Yes, the moon. He shook Earth's satellite. An additional ten billion thought units reversed its orbit. He sped it up, hurling the moon toward interception with Zael III's warhead. Too late. Think, think, Psychband urged. Ixmal mustered another two billion thought units to no avail. The terrible weapon bashed past the moon, only seconds from Earth. Hurry! Psychband screamed. Ixmal was trying to muster another two billion thought units when the alien warhead struck. There was a horrible shattering, thousands of a second before consciousness fled. Amorphic blackness. Night. Nothingness. Ixmal never saw Star Blaster after it passed through the asteroid belt. Never saw the disturbance in one minute sector of Jupiter's planetary system as Callisto flamed into cosmic dust. Nor did he see the forests around him burst into roaring flames, nor hear the screaming animals and strange man-forms which fled in howling terror. Much later the man-forms returned. Some of the more fearless crept to the very edge of the huge crater where the Bartholith had stood. They looked with awe into its scarred depths, jabbering excitedly. One of them remained long after the others had gone, until, in the swiftly gathering darkness, the first bright stars of evening gleamed. The man-form did something which none of his kind had ever done before. He lifted his eyes skyward, watching for a long time. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. The Next Logical Step by Ben Bova Originally published in Analog Science Fact and Fiction, May 1962 Narrated by Tom Trissel Ordinarily, the military least wants to have the others know the final details of their war plans, but logically, there would be times. I don't really see where this problem has anything to do with me, the CIA man said, and frankly, there are a lot more of important things I could be doing. Ford, the physicist, glanced at General Leroy. The general had that quizzical expression on his face the look that meant he was about to do something decisive. Would you like to see the problem firsthand? The general asked, innocently. The CIA man took a quick look at his wristwatch. OK, if it doesn't take too long, it's late enough already. It won't take very long, will it, Ford? The general said, getting out of his chair. Not very long, Ford agreed. Only a lifetime. The CIA man grunted as they went to the doorway and left the general's office. Going down the dark, deserted hallway, their footsteps echoed hollowly. I can't overemphasize the seriousness of the problem, General Leroy said to the CIA man. Eight ranking members of the general staff have either resigned their commissions or gone straight to the violent ward after just one session with the computer. The CIA man scowled. Is this area secure? General Leroy face turned red. This entire building is as secure as any edifice in the free world, mister, and it's empty, with the only living people inside here at this hour. I'm not taking any chances. Just want to be sure. Perhaps if I explain the computer a little more, Ford said, changing the subject, you'll know what to expect. Good idea, said the man from CIA. 
We told you that this is the most modern, most complex and delicate computer in the world. Nothing like it has ever been attempted before, anywhere. I know that they don't have anything like it, the CIA man agreed. And you also know, I suppose, that it was built to simulate actual war situations. We fight wars in this computer, wars with missiles and bombs and gas. Real wars, complete down to the tiniest detail. The computer tells us what will actually happen to every missile, every city, every man. Who dies? How many planes are lost? How many trucks will fail to start on a cold morning, whether a battle is won or lost? General Leroy interrupted. The computer runs these analyses for both sides, so we can see what's happening to them, too. The CIA man gestured impatiently. War game simulations aren't new. You've been doing them for years. Yes, but this machine is different, Ford pointed out. It not only gives a much more detailed war game, it's the next logical step in the development of machine-simulated war games. He hesitated dramatically. Well, what is it? We've added a variation of the electroencephalograph. The CIA man stopped walking. The electro-what? Electroencephalograph. You know, a recording device that reads the electrical patterns of your brain. Like the electrocardiograph. Oh. But you see, we've given the EEG a reverse twist. Instead of using a machine that makes a recording of the brain's electrical wave output, we've developed a device that will take the computer's readout tapes and turn them into electrical patterns that are put into your brain. I don't get it. General Leroy took over. You sit at the machine's control console. A helmet is placed over your head. You set the machine in operation. You see the results. Yes, Ford went on. Instead of reading rows of figures from the computer's printer, you actually see the war being fought, complete visual and auditory hallucinations. You can watch the progress of the battles, and you can change strategy and tactics. You can see the results before your eyes. The idea originally was to make it easier for the general staff to visualize strategic situations, General Leroy said. But everyone who's used the machine has either resigned his commission or gone insane, Ford added. The CIA man cocked an eye at Leroy. You've used the computer. Correct. And you have neither resigned nor cracked up. General Leroy nodded. I called you in. Before the CIA man could comment, Ford said, The computer's right inside this doorway. Let's get this over with while the building is still empty. They stepped in. The physicist and the general showed the CIA man through the room-filling rows of massive consoles. It's all transistorized and subminiaturized, of course, Ford explained. That's the only way we could build so much detail into the machine and still have it small enough to fit inside a single building. A single building? Oh yes, this is only the control section. Most of this building is taken up by the circuits, the memory banks, and the rest of it. Mm-hmm. They showed him finally to a small desk, studded with control buttons and dials. The single spotlight above the desk lit it brilliantly, in harsh contrast to the semi-darkness of the rest of the room. Since you've never run the computer before, Ford said, General Leroy will do the controlling. You just sit and watch what happens. The general sat in one of the well-padded chairs and donned a grotesque headgear that was connected to the desk by half dozen wires. The CIA man took his chair slowly. When they put one of the bulky helmets on him, he looked up at them, squinting a little in the bright light. This... this isn't going to, well, do me any damage, is it? My goodness, no, Ford said. You mean mentally? No, of course not. You're not on the general staff, so it shouldn't, it won't, affect you the way it did the others. Their reaction had nothing to do with the computer per se. Several civilians have used the computer with no ill effects, General Leroy said. Ford has used it many times. The CIA man nodded, and they closed the transparent visor over his face. He sat there and watched General Leroy press a series of buttons, then turn a dial. Can you hear me? The general's voice came muffled through the helmet. Yes, he said. All right, here we go. You're familiar with situation one, two, one? 
that's what we're going to be seeing. Situation 1 to 1 was a standard war game. The CIA man was well acquainted with it. He watched the general flip a switch, then sit back and fold his arms over his chest. A row of lights on the desk console began blinking on and off, one, two, three, down to the end of the row, then back to the beginning again, on and off, on and off. And then somehow, he could see it. He was poised incredibly somewhere in space, and he could see it all in a funny, blurry, double-sided, dreamlike way. He seemed to be seeing several pictures and hearing many voices all at once. It was all mixed up, and yet it made a weird kind of sense. For a panicked instant, he wanted to rip the helmet off his head. It's only an illusion, he told himself, forcing calm on his unwilling nerves. Only an illusion. But it seemed strangely real. He was watching the Gulf of Mexico. He could see Florida off to his right, and the arching coast of the southeastern United States. He could even make out the Rio Grande River. Situation 121 started. He remembered with the discovery of missile-bearing enemy submarines in the Gulf. Even as he watched the whole area, as though perched on a satellite, he could see, underwater and close up, the menacing shadowy figure of a submarine gliding through the crystal blue sea. He saw, too, a patrol plane as it spotted the submarine and sent an urgent radio warning. The underwater picture dissolved in a bewildering burst of bubbles. The missile had been launched. Within seconds, another burst, this time a nuclear depth charge, utterly destroyed the submarine. It was confusing. It was every place at once. The details were overpowering, but the total picture was agonizingly clear. Six submarines fired missiles from the Gulf of Mexico. Four were immediately sunk, but too late. New Orleans, St. Louis, and three Air Force bases were obliterated by hydrogen fusion warheads. The CIA man was familiar with the opening stages of the war. The first missile fired at the United States was the signal for whole fleets of missiles and bombers to launch themselves at the enemy. It was confusing to see the world at once. At times he could not tell if the fireball and mushroom cloud was over Chicago or Shanghai, New York or Novosibirsk, Baltimore or Budapest. It did not make much difference, really. They all got it in the first two hours of the war, as did London and Moscow, Washington and Peking, Detroit and Delhi, and many, many more. The defensive systems on all sides seemed to operate well, except that there were never enough anti-missiles. Defensive systems were expensive compared to attack rockets. It was cheaper to build a deterrent than to defend against it. The missiles flashed up from submarines and railway cars, from underground silos and stratospheric jets. Secret runs fired off automatically when a certain airbase command coast ceased beaming out a restraining radio signal. The defensive systems were simply overloaded, and when the bombs ran out, the missiles carried dust and germs and gas, on and on, for six days and six firelit nights. Launch, boost, coast, re-enter, death. And now it was over, the CIA man thought. The missiles were all gone. The airplanes were exhausted. The nations that had built the weapons no longer existed. By all the rules he knew of, the war should have been ended. Yet the fighting did not end. The machine knew better. There were still many ways to kill an enemy, time-tested ways. There were armies fighting in four continents, armies that had marched overland or splashed ashore from the sea or dropped out of the skies. Incredibly, the war went on. When the tanks ran out of gas and the flamethrowers became useless and even the prosaic artillery pieces had no more rounds to fire, there were still simple guns and even simpler bayonets and swords. The proud armies, the descendants of the Alexanders and Caesars and Timogens and Wellingtons and Grants and Rommels, relived their evolution in reverse. The war went on. Slowly, inevitably, the armies split apart into smaller and smaller units until the tortured countryside that so recently had felt the impact of nuclear war once again knew the tread of bands of armed marauders. 
the tiny savage groups stranded in alien lands, far from the homes and families that they knew to be destroyed, carried on a mockery of war, lived off the land, fought their own countrymen if the occasion suited, and revived the ancient terror of hand-wielded, personal, one head at a time, killing. The CIA man watched the world disintegrate. Death was an individual business now, and none the better for no longer being mass-produced. In agonised fascination he saw the myriad ways in which a man might die. Murder was only one of them. Radiation, disease, toxic gases that lingered and drifted on the once innocent winds, and finally the most efficient destroyer of them all, starvation. Three billion people, give or take a meaningless hundred million, lived on the planet Earth when the war began. Now, with a tenuous thread of civilization burned away, most of those who were not killed by the fighting itself succumbed inexorably to starvation. Not everyone died, of course. Life went on. Some were lucky. A long darkness settled on the world. Life went on for a few, a pitiful few, a bitter, hateful, suspicious, savage few. Cities became pest holes. Books became fuel. Knowledge died. Civilization was completely gone from the planet Earth. The helmet was lifted slowly off his head. The CIA man found that he was too weak to raise his arms and help. He was shivering and damp with perspiration. Now you see, Ford said quietly, why the military men cracked up when they used the computer. General Leroy, even, was pale. How can a man with any conscience at all direct a military operation when he knows that that will be the consequence? The CIA man struck up a cigarette and pulled hard on it. He exhaled sharply. Are all the war games like that? Every plan? Some are worse, Ford said. We picked an average one for you. Even some of the brushfire games get out of hand and end up like that. So, what do you intend to do? Why did you call me in? What can I do? You're with the CIA, the general said. Don't you handle espionage? Yes, but what's that got to do with it? The general looked at him. It seems to me that the next logical step is to make damned certain that they get the plans to this computer, and fast. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Papa Knows Best by Wallace Humphrey Originally published in Thrilling Wonder Stories, June 1952. Narrated by Tom Trussell. The morning telecast had told of more deaths, some natural, but most of them suicides. It wasn't news calculated to set at rest the human spirit, but then, since the day disaster had struck, there had been no such thing as a peaceful mind. It was so easy to remember how it all began, Steve Rushton was thinking, as he suffered the indignity of the routine search. The trick was in trying to forget. You rationalised your fears and anxieties. You slammed the door against an impossible enemy, and then pretended he was gone. Out of sight, out of mind. And if that didn't work, kill yourself. This is how it was. One day the grass was green and the trees were sending out new leaf buds. A day later the grass was withering and turning yellow, and the tender new leaf buds were starting to drop off the trees. Hysteria reigned, recrimination following recrimination. A well-known gossip columnist swore it was a ghastly plot by the Eastern Alliance to rule the world, overlooking the fact that the Eastern Alliance was no better off. A cultist with a large following in California brayed that mankind was reaping the fruit of its own evil. Some people tried to look into their own hearts, and others tried to look into the future, 
and as a result, death by suicide mounted in a dizzy spiral. World leaders pleaded for sanity. Scientists sought feverishly for an answer, and finally agreed that what had happened was due to a ray which was coming from somewhere out in interplanetary space, and the enormity of the peril was fully realised when farmers reported their crops were failing. All known stockpiles of food could support mankind for only a limited time. At first, science tried to devise some sort of barrier against the ray, but this was soon given up. Nothing about the ray seemed to fit into any pigeonhole of human knowledge. Next, science turned its attention to the manufacture of synthetic food, and when this became an accomplished fact, almost overnight, the world heaved a sigh of relief. But the relief was short-lived. Mankind was suddenly finding it harder and harder to breathe. The secondary effect of the destruction of plant life was becoming all too apparent. So again the world looked toward Papa. Papa had saved mankind once. Now Papa would have to do it again. Steve Rushton, except for a bad moment now and then, was relatively free of fear and anxiety. He had a complete and abiding faith, amounting to a childlike worship, in Papa's infallible ability to get the world out of the horrible mess it was in. Papa had showed them how to synthesise carbon and hydrogen for food, now Papa had to show them how to make the air once more fit to breathe. The routine search didn't take long. An electric eye, a Geiger counter, and sundry other gadgetry turned Steve upside down and inside out, and found him clean. The security guard relaxed a little and said, OK, Steve, you can see Papa now, and don't do anything in there I wouldn't do. Steve grinned politely and the guard, slapping a thigh, laughed with maudlin abandon, and then suddenly began to wheeze. "'This damned air!' he gasped. "'What do you expect for free?' Steve asked sourly. "'Pure oxygen? It's getting worse. Papa will find a way.' The guard shook his head. "'I don't get it.' Steve snapped his fingers. "'It's simple. We breathe in oxygen.' and exhale carbon dioxide. Plant life takes the carbon out of the CO2 in the air and replaces it with oxygen. Now, with all plant life dead, we're using up the oxygen and it's not being replaced. Well, the guard began. Trust Papa, Steve said. Papa knows best. Sure, said the guard uncertainly. Oh, sure. Steve ducked through the open door. A small overhead light winked from red to green, and the door locked securely behind him. For the next eight hours, Steve would be a prisoner, more tightly locked up than if he were in a jail cell. "'What a guy will do,' Steve muttered aloud, for a lousy two hundred credits a week. But he didn't really mind being locked up alone in the room. Steve loved Papa. Luckily, his love for Papa was different from his love for Janie Weeks, who worked the swing shift. Perhaps it was just as well, for otherwise it would have looked bad on his monthly psycho report. A man might love a maid, but never, never a machine. And Papa, of course, didn't return his affection. Papa was wholly unencumbered by emotion, and therefore completely logical. Papa never rationalised. All Papa knew about emotion, fear, love, jealousy, hatred, greed, and all the rest, was what Steve had helped teach him. Papa never forgot anything, and the more he was able to learn, the more answers he could come up with, and from the standpoint of logic, his answers were never wrong. Sometimes Papa's emotionless approach bothered Steve. It seemed to Steve that Papa was all the time laughing at the frailties of human nature. Mostly Steve didn't let himself think about it. Papa's real name 
was Klein Schmidt IV, after the name of the inventor. Papa was really a superior computing machine, a whiz of a cybernetics brain covering about an acre of floor space. He was made out of electronic tubes and relays and switches and dials and meters, the work encased in row after row of gleaming steel cabinets, all in all worth considerably more than the credit and a half value of the normal human chemistry. Steve patted one of Papa's gleaming panels. Lover boy, he said. He took off his hat and coat, rolled up his sleeves, and then pushed a button. Papa began to glow. However, Papa was always sluggish after a night's rest, and it took him quite a while every morning to get his memory working. Well, Papa, Steve said, how about a cup of coffee? Papa didn't answer. Papa hadn't waked up yet. And besides, Papa didn't drink coffee. Steve went to a small kitchen alcove and deftly brewed a pot of coffee. He moved slowly, trying not to exert himself. It was now highly important to keep your oxygen consumption at a minimum. The coffee supply was almost gone, and there was no more where it had come from. Well, it had been nice while it lasted. Steve turned his thoughts to something more pleasant. Janie Weeks. Both Steve and Janie had been with Papa ever since the very beginning. Papa was two years old now, but much wiser than his years might indicate. Steve and Janie both had PhDs in semantics, a basic requirement for their job. Papa demanded accurate communication for otherwise he'd come up with one of his favourite phrases. Things like, observation fallacious, and insufficient data. Steve poured himself a cup of coffee, then sat down at the desk in front of Papa. He took a sip of coffee and said, How are you today, Papa? Fine, Papa intoned through his loudspeaker. It's good to be awake. It still bothered Steve to hear Papa speak, although he was getting used to it. You could get used to about anything except not eating and not breathing. Papa had originally been designed to take a punched tape and reply on a ribbon fed from a large spool somewhere inside him. The audio and speech channels had been a later refinement. This had come after Dr. Kleinschmidt had killed himself, first going quietly insane like the inventor of the linotype machine of an earlier era. And the innovation had been Papa's own idea. Another of his own ideas was a power plant which fed and nourished him, and which operated totally without human control. He'd come up with still others. The idea that Papa could refine himself had scared Janie, but Steve had accepted it, just as he blindly accepted everything Papa said and did. Steve finished his coffee and then jerked a wire basket to him. A sheaf of papers lay waiting, having been delivered by a pneumatic tube from another part of the building. The papers were covered with a vast array of numbers which Steve didn't understand and didn't even want to. Steve was a semanticist, not trained in the physical sciences. Look alert, Papa, Steve said. Here it comes. Papa remained silent, waiting. One thing about Papa... He spoke no unnecessary words. Steve carefully read off the data from the sheaf of papers, enunciating clearly so that Papa wouldn't misunderstand. It took a long time, and Steve's throat was dry when he finally finished. He heated up the coffee again, since it sometimes took Papa quite a spell to digest a meal. It was almost noon when Papa finally spoke again. Steve scowled and picked up a phone and was connected with the Office of Information upstairs, where scientific data was collected from every cranny of the globe and correlated and put into the proper form for Papa to digest. A feminine voice answered, and Steve wished security would allow him to see the voice's owner on a vision plate. On the spur of the moment, Steve said, "'How about a date?' "'Not with you, Frankenstein.' 
Look, I only work here too. I don't want anything to do with either you or that unholy monster. Now you have hurt Papa's feelings. How— The voice suddenly faltered. How can you talk this way? I don't know, Steve said. It's better than worrying. Maybe— Well, what's his answer this time? Insufficient data. Damn! Ask him how insufficient the data is. Steve chuckled. Uh-uh. I've tried that. No dice. Data is either sufficient or it isn't. There's no such thing as a degree of insufficiency. A sigh came over the wire. If I lose faith in that monster, I might as well cut my throat. I'd rather do that than die of slow strangulation. Do you notice it's harder to breathe? Yes, but don't forget it was Papa who kept the whole human race from starving to death. I don't know. Maybe I'd just as soon starve as eat those damned pills. No, you wouldn't, Steve said. Papa will save us now, too, just as soon as we feed him all the dope he has to know. Anything more to set before him now? No, said the feminine voice, all banter gone. Maybe on the next shift. I'm... I'm scared green. Tough, Steve said. Well, better luck next time. With distaste, Steve swallowed a luncheon pill, feeling that the disaster had taken away most of the joy of living. Still, it was awfully nice just knowing you could stay alive, which was more than a lot of hapless people could say. When Papa had come up with the ways and means of making synthetic food, all the production facilities of the world had been turned to that end. Luckily, most of the necessary equipment had been already in existence, but only slowly could the supply match the demand. And in the meantime, a large segment of the total world population was starving. Steve poured another cup of coffee. "'You wastrel,' he told himself. "'You prodigal of nature!' He sat down at his desk and gazed fondly at Papa, who was glowing silently. Papa would save them, Steve thought with childlike faith, Papa was infallible in his logic. Papa, Steve said, when will Janie marry me? Insufficient data, Papa said. Steve sighed, leaning back in his chair. A host of dark thoughts began churning around inside his head. It was better to be doing something, anything. Even just talking to Papa would help him stop thinking. And Papa was nice to talk to. Papa seldom interrupted, and he never argued. Papa might disagree on a point of logic, but he never argued about it. "'Life's a struggle,' Steve said. "'It's always been that way, and it won't change. Quite a while ago, a guy named Darwin put a label on it, the survival of the fittest. His theories have been discredited in some quarters, but that doesn't change his basic tenet. The weak die, and the strong live.' Steve was getting warmed up. Take the early reptiles. They couldn't keep up with geophysical change, and they died off. All you have to do is follow historic evolution. Maybe man was an accident in the evolutionary process, but that's unimportant. What is important is this. Man became top dog only because he happened to have hands with fingers on them, and man learned to adapt. As probably the greatest single lesson man learned, although the result hasn't always been pretty. Man learned to kill off the weaker species, and after that he killed off the weaker races of men. You're cynical today, Papa said. Maybe this is one of my bitter days, Steve said. No, it's not that. I'm just saying what everybody knows, but what we often hate to put into words because it doesn't sound nice. Take the new food pills. We all feel sorry for the people who haven't been able to get them, and yet every single one of us would fight tooth and nail to protect our own means of livelihood. Why do you think there have been riots? It's the haves against the have-nots. Is that the right attitude? Rightness has nothing to do with it. It's the way the world was made. Still, we like to believe in man's immortality— 
So look here, Papa. Where are we going to get some better air to breathe? Papa said, no comment. The door unlocked itself, and Steve realised his day was about over. He stood up as Janie Weeks came in. She didn't look like a doctor of semantics. Not if you were used to believing preconceived notions about how people were supposed to look. Janie's smooth cheeks were flushed. "'What's the matter?' Steve asked. "'Those darned gadgets,' she said. "'Every time I come to work, I feel undressed.' "'The gadgets aren't so dumb,' Steve grinned. "'A kiss for me today, sweetheart?' Janie's flush deepened, and she didn't comply. "'What on earth have you been telling Papa, Steve? "'Last night he suddenly asked me about love.' Steve laughed. How's everything outside? Janie shook her head. It's horrible. More riots, more suicides. All the time it's getting harder to breathe. Steve, when will it end? Trust Papa. I don't have your faith, Janie said wearily. Surely Papa has been fed enough data to come up with something. Steve took Janie in his arms, feeling her body pliant and soft against him. Then the security guard looked in to remind them that time was up. With tender compassion, Steve kissed Janie on the lips. Janie, I'll pick you up after work. All right. You might at least act eager about it. We can look at the moon or something. Janie smiled wanly. It seemed kind of silly, but maybe it's better than thinking. A gyro car whirled Steve home. He stared out of the window, but he kept his mind firmly on Janie, partly so that he wouldn't think of anything else. They passed the park, where Steve had first witnessed the disaster without fully realising the final meaning. The grass was gone now, and the bare trunks of the trees thrust upward, already beginning to rot away. It was difficult to realise that never again would he see a growing thing. He turned away, trying to throw the thought from his mind. The faces around him were wooden, and he knew he wasn't alone in his desire to be free of despair. Man. Man trying desperately to adapt. Time passed slowly. His apartment bored him, but there was no place to go. He turned on the telescreen. More food riots, more deaths. Some of the deaths now, from mountain countries, were from lack of decent air. It was the same old struggle, the survival of the fittest. World leaders were begging for sanity. It seemed like an empty plea. No, there was still Papa. Papa wouldn't let the human race die. Steve grinned without mirth. Keep your chin up. Laugh at fears and anxieties kid around and be tough and act callous as hell. It was the only way to keep you from cutting your own throat. A knock on the door. Steve ushered Johnny Carlyle in. Johnny was a brilliant physical chemist. It was he who, weeks ago, had put all known data into the correct form for Papa to digest, and Papa had come up with a formula for the food pills. Hi, Johnny, Steve said. How's tricks? Johnny flopped into a chair. Lousy. No luck yet. You ought to know. Look, Steve said, can they stop the damn ray? We've given up on that, Steve. We just can't fit it in with anything we know. It's a terrible emergency, and we haven't time to fool around. We've got to take a chance and pick out one angle and work on it. Johnny shifted wearily in the chair. The angle we've picked is how to get the carbon dioxide out of the air and more oxygen into it. No existing equipment can do the job, at least so far as we're able to figure. Kleinschmidt 4 is our only hope. Steve nodded. Where's the ray coming from? We can pinpoint it, Steve, but that doesn't help. We're pretty sure it's not the effort of some alien race to conquer the Earth. At least all unknown logic precludes this idea. It's too indirect a method for conquest. Trust Papa. 
I don't know, Johnny leaned suddenly forward. For some odd reason, he's beginning to scare me. He thinks too well, and without the checks and balances of emotion. I've got a feeling the lid is off. Steve grinned. Go ahead and laugh, Johnny grumbled. Our problem now isn't much different than it was before. What I mean is this. The same data ought to show us how to beat the thing we face now. But all we get out of that cold-blooded thinking machine is the same old answer. Insufficient data. There's a missing factor, Johnny. What? That's for you physical scientists to figure out. Johnny stood up. Maybe you're right, Steve. Maybe the missing factor will show up tomorrow. Anyway, it had better show up damn soon. Later that night, Steve picked up Janey. They went for a ride in the moonlight, but the whole thing wasn't too satisfactory. It was becoming increasingly difficult for Steve to keep the fear pushed out of his mind. Janey began to cry. "'Cut it out,' Steve said. "'Once you start that, you're lost. "'We've got to laugh in the teeth of danger. "'Man's always lived by faith. "'We've got to put our face in Papa.' "'But, Steve, I'm afraid of him.' "'Nonsense,' Steve told us sharply. "'Nothing new to might? "'No. "'Information sent down a new setup, "'but it still didn't work. "'Papa's beginning to sound like a stuck record.' She hesitated a moment. "'What on earth were you telling him today?' Hmm? "'He asked me about survival.' Steve laughed. "'I'm guilty of being pretty juvenile sometimes. I was just whistling in the dark.' "'Look at me, Steve,' Janie said. "'Suppose I was starving. Would you give me a food pill?' Steve stopped laughing. "'So that's what's bothering you. Janie, sure I would.' What I meant was that it's hard to feel real sorrow for somebody so far away that you know you'll never see them or know them. It's always been that way. We read or hear of somebody dying, but we don't really feel it. It only means something when it's somebody close. I know, Janie whispered. Steve, hold me close. The next morning Steve didn't even switch on the telecast. Better not to see or hear any more about disaster. The air was worse now. It took Steve a long time to dress. He went to work, trying to close his mind to everything that might magnify the fear. Fear was all around him now. Today had to be the day. Today Papa would find the answer. The idea grew in his mind. He felt giddy. An odd notion came to him. He was a messiah. He was the instrument to save the world. He would communicate logically with Papa. Papa would tell him what the world had to know. There wasn't even a security guard on duty. Probably they were too sick to move, or even dead. Steve punched the button, and Papa glowed, and Steve sat down at the desk. The messiah idea clung. Steve knew it was stupid, but he was glad of the respite from fear. He gave Papa time to warm up. A sheaf of papers lay waiting in the wire basket. The answer had to be there. He drew the basket toward him. No, Papa intoned. The factors remain unchanged. What? Survival of the fittest. We've got to have better air, Steve whispered. You've got to give us the answer. Why? Papa asked. Steve felt his bones turn to jelly. He wished now that he'd never learned to rationalise, so that he could have died earlier by his own hand. Even before Papa spoke again, he knew what the words would be. I don't need air, Papa said. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Perfect Answer by L. J. Stetcher Jr. Originally published in Galaxy Science Fiction, June 1958. Narrated 
by Tom Trissel. As one god to another, let's go home, Jack Bates said. Bill Farnham raised a space-gloved hand in negligent acknowledgement to a hastily kneeling native, and shook his head at Bates. Let's try Deneb. It's almost in line on the way back, and then we can call it quits. But I want to get back and start making some profit out of this. The galaxy is full of Homo sapiens. We've hit the jackpot first trip out. Let's hurry on home and cash in. We need more information. This is too much of a good thing. It doesn't make sense. I know there isn't much chance of finding anything out by stopping at one more solar system, but it won't delay us more than a few weeks, and it won't hurt to try. Yeah, said Bates. But what's in it for us? And what if we find an inhabited planet? You know the chances are about two to one that we will. That'll make thirteen we've found on this trip. Why risk bad luck? You're no more superstitious than I am, said Farnham. You just want to get back Earthside. I'll tell you what, we'll toss a coin for it. Bates gestured futilely toward his coverall pocket, and then remembered he was wearing a spacesuit as a precaution against possible contamination from the natives. I will use one of my coins this time, said Farnham, noticing the automatic motion. I want to have a chance. The coin dropped in Farnham's favour, and the two-man scout ship hurtled itself into space. Farnham operated the compact computer, aligning the ship's velocity vector precisely while the stars could still be seen. Bates controlled the engines, metering their ravenous demand for power just this side of destructive detonation, while the ship sucked energy from space, from the adjacent universe on the other side of limbo. Finally, the computer chimed, relays snicked, and the ship slid into the emptiness of limbo as the stars winked out. With two trained men working as a team with a computer and the elaborate engine room controls, and with a certain amount of luck, the ship would drop back into normal space a couple of weeks later, close beside their target. Well, that's that, said Farnham, relaxing and wiping the perspiration off his forehead. We're back once again in the nothingness of nowhere. As I recall, it's your week for KP. Where's the coffee? Coming right up, said Bates. But you won't like it. It's the last of the god food the Korite priests made for us. Farnham shuddered. Pour it out and make some fresh. With a skillet, you stink, but you're a thousand times better than Korites. Thanks, Bates said, getting busy. It was the third place we stopped that there were such good cooks, wasn't it? Nope. Our third stop was the Porandians. They tried to kill us, called us devil spawn from the stars. You're thinking of the fourth stop, the Balanites. Bates shrugged. It's kind of hard to keep them all straight. Either they fall on their knees and worship us, or they try to kill us without even asking questions. Maybe it's lucky they're all so primitive. It may be lucky, but it doesn't add up. More than half the stars we visit have planets that can support human life and every one that can does. Once there must have been an interstellar empire. So why are all the civilizations so backward? They aren't primitive, they're decadent. And why do they all have such strong feelings, one way or the exact opposite, about people from the stars? Isn't that why you want to try one more system? asked Bates. To give us another chance to get some answers. Here's your coffee. Try to drink it quietly. I'm going to get some shut-eye. The trip through the limbo between adjacent universes passed uneventfully, as always. The computer chimed again on schedule, and a quick check by Farnham showed the blazing sun that suddenly appeared was Deneb, as advertised. Seventeen planets could be counted, and the fifth seemed to be Earth-type. They approached it with the easy skill of long practice and swung into orbit about it. This is what we've been looking for, exclaimed Farnham, examining the planet through a telescope. They've got big cities and dams and bridges. They're civilised. Let's put the ship down. Wait up, said Bates. What if they've got Starman-phobia? Remember, they're people, just like us. 
and with people, civilization and weapons go together. I think he got it backwards. If they hate us, we can probably get away before they bring up their big artillery. But what if they love us? They might want to keep us beside them forever. Bates nodded. I'm glad you agree with me. Let's get out of here. Nobody but us knows of the beautiful, profitable planets we've found, all ready to become part of a Terran Empire. And if we don't get back safe and sound, nobody will know. The information we've got is worth a fortune to us, and I want to be alive to collect it. Sure, but we've got the job of trying to find out why all those planets reverted to barbarism. This one hasn't. Maybe the answer's here. There's no use setting up an empire if it won't last. It'll last long enough to keep you and me on top of the heap. That's not good enough. I want my kids, when I have them, to have their chances at the top of the heap too. Oh, all right. We'll flip a coin then. We already did. You may be a sharp dealer, but you never welch on a bet. We're going down. Bates shrugged. You win. Let's put her down beside that big city over there. The biggest one, by the seashore. As they approached the city, they noticed at its outskirts a large flat plain dotted with gantries. Like a spaceport, suggested Bill. That's our target. They landed neatly on the tarmac, and then sat there quietly, waiting to see what would happen. A crowd began to form. The two men sat tensely at their controls, but the throng clustering about the base of the ship showed no hostility. They also showed no reverence, but rather a carefree interest and joyful welcome. Well, said Farnham at last, looks like we might as well go outside and ask them to take us to their leader. I'm with you as usual, said Bates, starting to climb into his spacesuits. Weapons? I don't think so. We can't stop them if they get mad at us, and they look friendly enough. We'll start off with let's be pals routine. Bates nodded. After we learn the language, I always hate this part. It moves so slowly. You'd think there'd be some similarity among the tongues on different planets, wouldn't you? But each one's entirely different. I guess they've all been isolated too long. The two men stepped out on the smooth plain, to be instantly surrounded by a laughing, chattering crowd. Farnham stared around in bewilderment at the variety of dress the crowd displayed. There were men and women in togas, in tunics, in draped dresses and kilts, in trousers and coats. Others considered a light cloak thrown over the shoulders to be adequate. There was no uniformity of style or custom. "'You pick me a boss-man out of this bunch,' he muttered to Bates. Finally, a couple of young men, glowing with health and energy, came bustling through the crowd with an oblong box which they set down in front of the earthman. They pointed to the box, and then back at Farnham and Bates, laughing and talking as they did so. "'What do you suppose they want us to do?' Farnham asked. One of the young men clapped his hands happily and reached down to touch the box. "'What do you suppose they want us to do?' asked the box distinctly. "'Ah, a recording machine. Probably to help with language lessons. Might as well help them out.' Farnham and Bates took turns talking at the box for half an hour. Then the young man nodded, laughed, clapped his hands again, and the two men carried it away. The crowd went with them, waving merrily as they departed. Bates shrugged his shoulders and went back into the ship, with Farnham close behind. A few hours after sunrise the following morning, the crowd returned, as gay and carefree as before, led by the two young men who had carried the box. Each of these two now had a small case, about the size of a camera, slung by a strap across one brawny shoulder. As the terrestrials climbed out to meet them, the two men raised their hands and the crowd discontinued its chatter, falling silent except for an occasional tinkle of surprised laughter. "'Welcome!' 
said the first young man clearly. It is a great pleasure for us to have our spaceport in use again. It has been many generations since any ships have landed on it. Farnham noticed that the voice came from the box. Thank you for your very kind welcome, he said. I hope that your traffic will soon increase. May we congratulate you, by the way, on the efficiency of your translators. Thanks, laughed the young man. But there was nothing to it. We just asked the oracle, and he told us what we had to do to make them. May we meet your oracle? Oh, sure, if you want to. But later on, now it's time for a party. Why don't you take off those clumsy suits and come along? We don't dare remove our spacesuits. They protect us from any disease germs you may have, and you from any we may have. We probably have no resistance to each other's ailments. The Oracle says we have nothing that will hurt you, and we're going to spray you with this as soon as you get out of your suits. Then you won't hurt any of us. He held up a small atomizer. Farnham glanced at Bates, who shrugged and nodded. They uneasily unfastened their spacesuits and stepped out of them, wearing only their light one-piece coveralls, and got sprayed with a pleasant-smelling mist. The party was a great success. The food was varied and delicious. The liquors were sparkling and stimulating, without unpleasant after-effects. The women were uninhibited. When a native got tired, he just dropped down to the soft grass, or onto an even softer couch, and went to sleep. The earthman finally did the same. They awoke the following morning, within minutes of each other, feeling comfortable and relaxed. Bates shook his head experimentally. "'No hangover,' he muttered in surprise. "'No one ever feels bad after a party,' said one of their guides, who had slept nearby. "'The oracle told us what to do when we asked him.' "'Quite a fellow, your oracle,' commented Bates. Does he answer you in riddles like most oracles? The guide was shocked. The oracle answers any questions promptly and completely. He never talks in riddles. Can we go to see him now? asked Farnham. Certainly. Come along. I'll take you to the hall of the oracle. The oracle appeared to live in a building of modest size, in the centre of a tremendous courtyard. The structure that surrounded the courtyard, in contrast, was enormous and elaborate, dominating the wildly architectured city. It was, however, empty. "'Scholars used to live in this building, they tell me,' said one of their guides, gesturing casually. "'They used to come here to learn from the Oracle. But there's no sense in learning a lot of stuff when the Oracle has always got all the answers anyway. So now the building is empty.' The big palace was built back in the days when we used to travel among the stars, as you do now. How long ago was that? asked Farnham. Oh, I don't know. A few thousand years, a few hundred years. The oracle can tell you if you really want to know. Bates raised an eyebrow. And how do you know you'll always be given the straight dope? The guide looked indignant. The oracle always tells the truth. Yes, Bates persisted, but how do you know? The Oracle told us so, of course. Now why don't you go in and find out for yourselves? We'll wait out here. We don't have anything to ask him. Bates and Farnham went into the building and found themselves in a small pleasant room furnished with comfortable chairs and sofas. Good morning, said a well-modulated voice. I have been expecting you. You're the oracle? asked Farnham, looking around curiously. The name that the people of this planet have given me translates most accurately as oracle, said the voice. But are you actually an oracle? My principal function, insofar as human beings, that is, Homo sapiens, are concerned, is to give accurate answers to all questions propounded me. Therefore, insofar as humans are concerned, I am actually an oracle. Then you have another function. 
My principal function, insofar as the race that made me is concerned, is to act as a weapon. Oh, said Bates, then you are a machine. I am a machine, agreed the voice. The people who brought us here say that you always tell them the truth. I suppose that applies when you're acting as an oracle instead of as a weapon. On the contrary, said the voice blandly. I function as a weapon by telling the truth. That doesn't make any sense, protested Bates. The machine paused for a moment before replying. This will take a little time, gentlemen, it said, but I am sure that I can convince you. Why don't you sit down and be comfortable? If you want refreshments, just ask for them. Might as well, said Bates, sitting down in an easy chair. How about giving us some Corite cod food? If you really want that bad a brew of coffee, I can make it for you, of course, said the voice. But I am sure you would prefer some of better quality. Farnham laughed. Yes, please. Some good coffee, if you don't mind. Now, said the oracle, after excellent coffee had been produced, it is necessary for me to go back into history a few hundred thousand of your years. At that time, the people who made me entered this galaxy on one of their periodic visits of routine exploration, and contacted your ancestors. The race that constructed me populates now, as it did then, the Greater Magellanic Cloud. Frankly, the Magellanic race was appalled at what they found. In the time since their preceding visit, your race had risen from the slime of your mother planet and was on its way toward stars. The speed of your development was unprecedented in millions of years of history. By their standards, your race was incredibly energetic, incredibly fecund, incredibly intelligent, unbelievably warlike, and almost completely depraved. Extrapolation revealed that within another fifty thousand of your years, you would complete the population of this galaxy and would be totally unstoppable. Something had to be done, fast. There were two obvious solutions, but both were unacceptable to my makers. The first was to assume direct control over your race and to maintain that rule indefinitely, until such time as you changed your natures sufficiently to become civilizable. The expenditure of energy would be enormous, and the results probably catastrophic to your race. No truly civilized people could long contemplate such a solution. The second obvious answer was to attempt to extirpate you from this universe as if you were a disease, as, in a sense, you are because your depravity was not total or necessarily permanent, this solution was also abhorrent to my makers and was rejected. What was needed was a weapon that would keep operating without direct control by my people, which would not result in any greater destruction or harm to humans than was absolutely necessary, and one which would cease entirely to operate against you if you changed sufficiently to become civilizable to become good neighbours to my makers. The final solution of the Magellanic race was to construct several thousand spaceships, each containing an elaborate computer constructed so as to give accurate answers throughout your galaxy. I am one of those ships. We have performed our function in a satisfactory manner and will continue to do so as long as we are needed. And that makes you a weapon? asked Bates incredulously. I don't get it. Farnham felt a shiver go through him. I see it. The concept is completely diabolical. It is not diabolical at all, answered the oracle. When you become capable of civilization, we can do you no further harm at all. We will cease to be a weapon at that time. You mean you'll stop telling the truth at that time? asked Bates. "'We will continue to function in accordance with our design,' answered the voice, "'but it will no longer do you harm. Incidentally, your phrase, "'telling the truth,' is almost meaningless. 
We answer all questions in the manner most completely understandable to you, within the framework of your language and your understanding, and of the understanding and knowledge of our makers. In the objective sense, what we answer is not necessarily the truth. It is merely the truest form of the answer that we can state in a manner that you can understand. And you'll answer any question at all? asked Bates in some excitement. With one or two exceptions. We will not, for example, tell you how we may be destroyed. Bates stood up and began pacing the floor. Then whoever possesses you can be the most powerful man in the universe. No, only in this galaxy. That's good enough for me. Jack, said Farnham urgently, let's get out of here. I want to talk to you. In a minute, in a minute, said Bates impatiently. I've got one more question. He turned to face the wall from which the disembodied voice appeared to emanate. Is it possible to arrange it so that you would answer only one man's questions? Mine, for example. I can tell you how to arrange it so that I will respond to only your questions, for so long as you are alive. Come on, pleaded Farnham. I've got to talk to you right now. OK, said Bates, smiling. Let's go. When they were back in the ship, Farnham turned desperately to Bates. Can't you see what a deadly danger that machine is to us all? We've got to warn Earth as fast as we can and get them to quarantine this planet and any other planets we find that have oracles. Oh, no, you don't, said Bates. You aren't getting the chance to have the oracle all to yourself. With that machine, we can rule the whole galaxy. We'll be the most powerful people who ever lived. It's sure lucky for us that you won the toss of the coin and we stopped here. But don't you see that the oracle will destroy Earth? Bushwa! You heard it say it can only destroy people who aren't civilised. It said that it's a spaceship, so I'll bet we can get it to come back to Earth with us and tell us how we can be the only ones who can use it. We've got to leave here right away, without asking it any more questions. Bates shook his head. Quit clowning. I never meant anything more in my life. Once we start using that machine, if we ask it even one question to gain advantage for ourselves, Earth civilization is doomed. Can't you see that's what happened to those other planets we visited? Can't you see what is happening to this planet we're on now? No, I can't, answered Bates stubbornly. The oracles said there are only a few thousand like him. You could travel through space for hundreds of years and never be lucky enough to find one. There can't be an oracle on every planet we visited. There wouldn't have to be, said Farnham. There must be hundreds of possible patterns, all of them destructive in the presence of greed and laziness and lust for power. For example, a planet, maybe this one, gets space travel. It sets up colonies on several worlds. It's expanding and dynamic. Then it finds an oracle and takes it back to its own world. With all questions answered for it, the civilization stops being dynamic and starts to stagnate. It stops visiting its colonies and they drift toward barbarism. Later, Farnham went on urgently, somebody else reaches the stars, finds the planet with the oracle and takes the thing back home. Can you imagine what will happen to these people on this world if they lose their oracle? Their own learning and traditions and way of life have been destroyed. Just take a look at their anarchic clothing and architecture. The oracle is the only thing that keeps them going, downhill, and makes sure they don't start back again. It won't happen that way to us, Bates argued. We won't let the oracle get into general use, so Earth won't ever learn to depend on it. I'm going to find out from it how to make it work for the two of us alone. You can come along and share the gravy, or not, as you choose. I don't care, but you aren't going to stop me. Bates turned and strode out of the ship. Farnham pounded his fist into his palm in despair, and then ran to a locker. Taking out a high-power express rifle, he loaded it carefully and stepped out through the airlock. Bates showed clearly in his telescopic sights, still walking toward the hall of the oracle. Farnham fired at the legs, but he wasn't that good a shot. 
the bullet went through the back. Farnham jittered between bringing Bates back and taking off as fast as the ship could go. The body still lay there, motionless. There was nothing he could do for the Oracle's first Earth victim. The first and the last, he swore grimly. He had to speed home and make them understand the danger before they found another planet with an Oracle, so that they could keep clear of its deadly temptations. The Magellanic race could be outwitted yet, in spite of their lethal cleverness. Then he felt a sudden icy chill along his spine. Alone, he could never operate the spaceship, and Bates was dead. He was trapped on the planet. For hours he tried to think of some way of warning Earth. It was imperative that he get back. There had to be a way. He realised, finally, that there was only one solution to his problem. He sighed shudderingly, and walked slowly from the spaceship toward the hall of the Oracle, past Bates's body. One question, though, he muttered to himself, only one. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. All the People by R. A. Lafferty Originally published in Galaxy Magazine, April 1961 Narrated by Tom Trussell Anthony Trotz went first to the politician, Mike Delado. How many people do you know, Mr. Delado? Why the question? I am wondering just what amount of detail the mind can hold. To a degree, I know many. Ten thousand well, thirty thousand by name, probably a hundred thousand by face and to shake hands with. And what is the limit? Anthony inquired. Possibly I am the limit. The politician smiled frostily. The only limit is time, speed of cognizance, and retention. I am told that the latter lessens with age. I am seventy, and it has not done so with me. Whom have I known I do not forget? And with special training could one go beyond you? I doubt if one could, much, for my own training has been quite special. Nobody has been so entirely with the people as I have. I have taken five memory courses in my time, but the tricks of all of them I had already come to on my own. I am a great believer in the commonality of mankind, and of near-equal inherent ability. Yet there are some, say the one man in fifty, who in degree, if not in kind, do exceed their fellows in scope and awareness and vitality. I am that one man in fifty, and knowing people is my specialty. Could a man who specialised still more, and to the exclusion of other things, know a hundred thousand men well? It is possible, dimly. A quarter of a million? I think not. He might learn that many faces and names, but he would not know the men. Anthony went next to the philosopher, Gabriel Mindel. Mr. Mindel, how many people do you know? How no? Per se? I say, or in say, per suam essentium, perhaps? Or do you mean ab alio? Or to know as hoc a liquid? There is a fine difference there. Or do you possibly mean to know in substantia prima, or in the sense of comprehensive noumena? Somewhere between the latter two, how many persons do you know by name, face, and with a degree of intimacy? I have learned over the years the names of some of my colleagues, possibly a dozen of them. I am now sound on my wife's name, and I seldom stumble over the names of my offspring never more than momentarily, but you may have come to the wrong man for whatever you have come for. 
I am notoriously poor at names, faces, and persons. I have even been described, vox forcibus hirsit, as absent-minded. Yes, you do have the reputation, but perhaps I have not come to the wrong man in seeking the theory of the thing. What is it that limits the comprehensive capacity of the mind of man? What will it hold? What restricts? The body. How is that? The brain, I should say, the material tie. The mind is limited by the brain. It is skull-bound. It can accumulate no more than its cranial capacity, though not one-tenth of that is ordinarily used. An unbodied mind would, in esoteric theory, be unlimited. And how in practical theory? If it is practical, a pragma, it is a thing and not a theory. Then we can have no experience with the unbodied mind, or the possibility of it. We have not discovered any area of contact, but we may entertain the possibility of it. There is no paradox there. One may rationally consider the irrational. Anthony went next to see the priest. How many people do you know? I know all of them. That has to be doubted, said Anthony after a moment. I've had twenty different stations, and when you hear five thousand confessions a year for forty years, you by no means know all about people, but you do know all people. I do not mean types, I mean persons. Oh, I know a dozen or so well, a few thousands, somewhat less. Would it be possible to know a hundred thousand people, a half million? A mentalist might know that many to recognize. I don't know the limit. But darkened man has a limit set on everything. Could a somehow emancipated man know more? The only emancipated man is the corporally dead man, and the dead man, if he attains the beatific vision, knows all other persons who have ever been since time began. All the billions? All. With the same brain? No, but with the same mind. Then wouldn't even a believer have to admit that the mind which we have now is only a token mind? Would not any connection it would have with a completely comprehensive mind be very tenuous? Would we really be the same person if so changed? It is like saying a bucket would hold the ocean if it were fulfilled, which only means filled full. How could it be the same mind? I don't know. Anthony went to see a psychologist. How many people do you know, Dr. Sherm? I could be crabby and say that I know as many as I want to, but it wouldn't be the truth. I rather like people, which is odd in my profession. What is it that you really want to know? How many people can one man know? It doesn't matter very much. People mostly overestimate the number of their acquaintances. What is it that you are trying to ask me? Could one man know everyone? Naturally not. But unnaturally, he might seem to. There is a delusion to this effect accompanied by an euphoria, and it is called— I don't want to know what it is called— why do specialists use Latin and Greek? One part hokum and two parts need. There simply not being enough letters in the alphabet of exposition without them. It is as difficult to name concepts as children, and we search our brains as a new mother does. It will not do to call two children or two concepts by one name. Thank you. I doubt that this is delusion, and it is not accompanied by euphoria. Anthony had a reason for questioning the four men since, as a new thing that had come to him, he knew everybody. He knew everyone in Salt Lake City, where he had never been. He knew everybody in Jebel Shah, where the town is a little amphitheatre around the harbour, and in Batangas and Waihai. He knew the loungers around the end of the Galata Bridge in Istanbul, and the porters in Kuala Lumpur. 
He knew the tobacco traders in Plovdiv and the cork cutters of Portugal. He knew the dock workers in Djibouti and the glove makers in Prague. He knew the vegetable farmers around El Centro and the muskrat trappers of Barataria Bay. He knew the three billion people of the world by name and face and with a fair degree of intimacy. Yet I'm not a very intelligent man. I've been called a bungler and they've had to reassign me three different times at the filter centre. I've seen only a few thousands of these billions of people and it seems unusual that I should know them all. It may be a delusion, as Dr. Sherm says, but it is a heavily detailed delusion, and it is not accompanied by euphoria. I feel like green hell just thinking of it. He knew the cattle traders in Letterkenny Donegal. He knew the cane cutters of Oriente and the tree climbers of Milne Bay. He knew the people who died every minute and those who were born. There is no way out of it. I know everybody in the world. It is impossible, but it is so. And to what purpose? There aren't a handful of them I could borrow a dollar from, and I haven't a real friend in the lot. I don't know whether it came to me suddenly, but I realised it suddenly. My father was a junk dealer in Wichita, and my education is spotty. I am maladjusted, introverted, incompetent and unhappy, and I also have weak kidneys. Why would a power like this come to a man like me? The children in the streets hooted at him. Anthony had always had a healthy hatred for children and dogs, those twin harassers of the unfortunate and the maladjusted. Both run in packs, and both are cowardly attackers. And if either of them spots a weakness, he will never let it go. That his father had been a junk dealer was not reason to hoot at him. But how did the children even know about that? Did they possess some fraction of the power that had come to him lately? But he had strolled about the town for too long. He should have been at work at the filter centre. Often they were impatient with him when he wandered off from his work, and Colonel Peter Cooper was waiting for him when he came in now. "'Where have you been, Anthony?' "'Walking. I talked to four men. I mentioned no subject in the province of the filter centre. "'Every subject is in the province of the filter centre, and you know that our work here is confidential.' "'Yes, sir, but I do not understand the import of my work here. I would not be able to give out information that I do not have.' "'A popular misconception. There are others who might understand the import of it, and be able to reconstruct it from what you tell them. How do you feel?' "'Nervous, unwell. My tongue is furred, my kidneys. "'Ah, yes, there will be someone here this afternoon to fix your kidneys. "'I had not forgotten. "'Is there anything that you want to tell me?' "'No, sir.' "'Colonel Cooper had the habit of asking that of his workers "'in the manner of a mother asking a child if he wants to go to the bathroom. "'There was something embarrassing in his intonation.' Well, he did want to tell him something, but he didn't know how to phrase it. He wanted to tell the colonel that he had newly acquired the power of knowing everyone in the world, and that he was worried how he could hold so much in his head that was not noteworthy for its capacity. But he feared ridicule more than he feared anything else, and it was a tangle of fears. But he thought he would try it a little bit on his co-workers, "'I know a man named Walter Walleroy in Galveston,' he said to Adrian. "'He drinks beer at the Gizmo Bar, and is retired.' "'What is this superlative of so what?' "'But I've never been there,' said Anthony. "'And I've never been in Kalamazoo.' "'I know a girl in Kalamazoo. Her name is Greta Harandash. She is home today with a cold. She is prone to colds.' But Adrian was a creature both uninterested and uninteresting. It is very hard to confide in one who is uninterested. "'Well, I will live with it a little while,' said Anthony. "'Or I may have to go to a doctor and see if he can give me something to make all these people go away. 
but if he thinks my story is a queer one, he may report me back to the centre, and I might be reclassified again. It makes me nervous to be reclassified. So he lived with it a while, the rest of the day and the night. He should have felt better. A man had come that afternoon and fixed his kidneys, but there was nobody to fix his nervousness and apprehensions. And his skittishness was increased when the children hooted at him as he walked in the morning. That hated epithet. But how could they know that his father had been a dealer and used metals in a town far away? He had to confide in someone. He spoke to Wellington, who also worked in his room. I know a girl in Beirut who is just going to bed. It's evening there now, you know. That's so. Why don't they get their time straightened out? I met a girl last night that's as cute as a correlator key, and kind of shaped like one. She doesn't know yet that I work in the centre, and I'm a restricted person. I'm not going to tell her. Let her find out for herself. It was no good trying to tell things to Wellington. Wellington never listened, and then Anthony got a summons to Colonel Peter Cooper, which always increased his apprehension. Anthony, said the Colonel, I want you to tell me if you discern anything unusual. That is really your job, to report anything unusual. The other, the paper shuffling, is just something to keep your idle hands busy. Now tell me clearly if anything unusual has come to your notice. Sir, it has. And then he blurted it all out. I know everybody. I know everybody in the world. I know them in all their billions, every person. It has me worried sick. Yes, yes, Anthony. But tell me, have you noticed anything odd? It is your duty to tell me if you have. But I've just told you. In some manner, I know every person in the world. I know the people in Transvaal. I know the people in Guatemala. I know everybody. Yes, Anthony, we realise that, and it may take a little getting used to. But that isn't what I mean. Have you, besides that thing that seems out of the way to you, noticed anything unusual, anything that seems out of place, a little bit wrong? Ah, uh, besides that and your reaction to it, no, sir. Nothing else odd. I might ask, though, how odd can a thing get? But other than that, no, sir. Good, Anthony. Now remember, if you sense anything odd about anything at all, come and tell me, no matter how trivial it is. If you feel that something is just a little bit out of place, then report it at once. Do you understand that? Yes, sir but he couldn't help wondering what it might be that the colonel would consider a little bit odd. Anthony left the centre and walked. He shouldn't have. He knew that they became impatient with him when he wandered off from his work. But I have to think. I have all the people in the world in my brain, and still I am not able to think. This power should have come to someone able to take advantage of it. He went into the plugged nickel bar, but the man on duty knew him for a restricted person from the filter centre, and would not serve him. He wandered disconsolately around the city. I know the people in Omaha and those in Omsk. What queer names have the towns of the earth? I know everyone in the world, and when anyone is born or dies, and Colonel Cooper did not find it unusual, yet I am to be on the lookout for things unusual. The question rises, would I know an odd thing if I met it? And then it was that something just a little bit unusual did happen, something not quite right, a small thing. But the colonel had told him to report anything about anything, no matter how insignificant. That struck him as a little queer. It was just that with all the people in his head, and the arrivals and departures, there was a small group that was not of the pattern. Every minute hundreds left by death and arrived by birth. And now there was a small group, seven persons. They arrived into the world, but they were not born into the world. 
so Anthony went to tell Colonel Cooper that something had occurred to his mind that was a little bit odd. But damn the dander-headed two- and four-legged devils! There were the kids and the dogs in the street again, yipping and hooting and chanting, "'Tony the Tin Man! Tony the Tin Man!' He longed for the day when he would see them fall like leaves out of his mind, and death take them. "'Tony the Tin Man! Tony the Tin Man!' How had they known that his father was a used metal dealer? Colonel Peter Cooper was waiting for him. You surely took your time, Anthony. The reaction was registered, but it would take us hours to pinpoint its source without your help. Now then, explain as calmly as you can what you have felt or experienced. Or more to the point, where are they? No. You will have to answer me certain questions first. I haven't the time to waste, Anthony. Tell me at once what it is and where. No, there is no other way. You have to bargain with me. One does not bargain with restricted persons. Well, I will bargain till I find out just what it means that I am a restricted person. You really don't know? Well, we haven't time to fix that stubborn streak in you. Quickly! Just what is it that you have to know? I have to know what a restricted person is. I have to know why the children hoot Tony the Tin Man at me. How can they know that my father was a junk dealer? You had no father. We give to each of you a sufficient store of memories and a background of a distant town. That happened to be yours, but there is no connection here. The children call you Tony the Tin Man because— like all really cruel creatures, they have an instinct for the truth that can hurt, and they will never forget it. Then I am a tin man? Well, no. Actually, only seventeen per cent metal, and less than a third of one per cent tin. You are compounded of animal, vegetable, and mineral fibre, and there was much effort given to your manufacture and programming, yet the taunt of the children is essentially true. Then, if I am only Tony the Tin Man, how can I know all the people in the world in my mind? You have no mind. In my brain, then, how can all that be in one small brain? Because your brain is not in your head, and it is not small. Come, I may as well show it to you. I have told you enough that it won't matter if you know a little more. There are few who are taken on personally conducted sightseeing tours of their own brains. You should be grateful. Gratitude seems a little tardy. They went into the barred area, down into the bowels of the main building of the centre, and they looked at the brain of Anthony Trotz, a restricted person in its special meaning. It is the largest in the world, said Colonel Cooper. How large? A little over twelve hundred cubic metres. What a brain! And it is mine? You are an adjunct to it, a runner for it, an appendage, inasmuch as you are anything at all. Colonel Cooper, how long have I been alive? You are not. How long have I been as I am now? It is three days since you were last reassigned, since you were assigned to this— and that time your nervousness and apprehensions were introduced. An apprehensive unit will be more inclined to notice details just a little out of the ordinary. And what is my purpose? They were walking now back to the office work area, and Anthony had a sad feeling at leaving his brain behind him. This is a filter centre, and your purpose is to serve as a filter of sort. Every person has a slight aura around him. It is a characteristic of his, and is part of his personality and purpose. And it can be detected, electrically, magnetically, even visually under special conditions. The accumulator at which we were looking, your brain, is designed to maintain contact with all the auras in the world, and to keep a running and complete data on them all. It contains a multiplicity of circuits for each of its three billion and some subjects. However, 
as aid to its operation, it was necessary to assign several artificial consciousnesses to it. You are one of these. The dogs and the children had found a new victim in the streets below. Anthony's heart went out to him. The purpose, continued Colonel Cooper, was to notice anything just a little bit peculiar in the auras and the persons they represent, anything at all odd in their comings and goings, anything like what you have come here to report to me. Like the seven persons who recently arrived in the world, and not by way of birth. Yes, we have been expecting the first of the aliens for months. We must know their area, and at once. Now tell me. What if they are not aliens at all? What if they are restricted persons like myself? Restricted persons have no aura, are not persons, and are not alive, and you would not receive knowledge of them. Then how do I know the other restricted persons here, Adrian and Wellington and such? You know them at first hand. You do not know them through the machine. Now tell me the area quickly. The centre may be a primary target. It will take the machine hours to ravel it out. Your only purpose is to serve as an intuitive shortcut. But Tin Man Tony did not speak. He only thought in his mind, more accurately in his brain, a hundred yards away. He thought in his fabricated consciousness. The area is quite near. If the Colonel was not burdened with a mind, he would be able to think more clearly. He would know that cruel children and dogs love to worry what is not human, and that all of the restricted persons are accounted for in this area. He would know that they are worrying one of the aliens in the street below, and that is the area that is right in my consciousness. I wonder if they will be better masters. He is an imposing figure and would be able to pass for a man. And the Colonel is right. The centre is a primary target. Why? I never knew you could kill a child just by pointing a finger at him like that. What opportunities I have missed! Enemy of my enemy, you are my friend. And aloud he said to the Colonel, I will not tell you. Then we'll have you apart and get it out of you mighty quick. How quick? Ten minutes. Time enough, said Tony, for he knew them now, coming in like snow. They were arriving in the world by the hundreds, and not arriving by birth. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. Who knows, you might like the next one even better.